As a devout Jew living in Rome in 55 AD, imagine you receive a letter from Paul of Tarsus. And Paul has urgent news all the way from Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem, where James, a Jew, was killed, beheaded with a sword 10 years earlier for talking about this news about Jesus. And 10 years before that, Stephen was stoned about news of Jesus. Most recently, this year, 55, Philip was crucified upside down in Heropolis for news about Jesus. So I wonder what Paul has to say about news about this Jesus. And as a Jew, you're focused on observe, observing Torah law. But Paul says he has news that changes Israel forever and her practices forever. This news will change all nations forever. This news about Jesus will complete Israel's purpose. Paul begins his letter with the announcement, the king in the lineage of David, the one that God promised to deliver, is here. He came to remove the curse of sin's power. All the world is destined to die apart from God for all eternity, but those who trust Jesus are now saved from sin's power. By their faith, the law completed God's purpose. The life and words of one person have completed the law, King Jesus. Followers of Jesus live in his spirit. God selected Israel for his purpose, just like Jesus selected Paul to be his mission, a messenger, or like he selected the 12 disciples for his purpose. Remember, not everyone responds to God's messengers. Not everyone responds to God's invitation. Some stubbornly reject God. For the faithful whose will is to do God's will, God shapes these into his vessels of mercy. God saves through a relationship with his son. Our faith in God's faithfulness to accomplish what he promises in his word, Jesus. This is Romans chapter 10. In the last chapter, we discussed the hardening of our hearts, the opposite of what happens when we have faith. And we contrasted two characters, Pharaoh and Moses, in Exodus chapters 4 through 10. No matter what Hebrew word you use, kazak, kasha, kabed, all of them lead to the understanding that hardening is not God arbitrarily picking and choosing. It's not automatically determining people's minds, zapping their, their minds. Hardening solidifies where they are already going. It firms up their heavy heart or their stiff-necked ways not to turn around. Hardening isn't always about salvation. Pharaoh's hardened heart was about letting God's people go so they could celebrate God's holy feast in the desert. And hardening isn't always complete or permanent. Remember, Pharaoh is hardened multiple times, then lets the Jews go. And Rahab, Rahab all the way in Jericho, well, she heard about Pharaoh's hard heart and what happened to those Egyptians and what happened to Pharaoh's armies. See, the news traveled all the way back to Jericho where Rahab lived. And when the Israelites reach Jericho, Rahab is saved. Same thing happens with Gentiles and Jews at Pentecost, some of which were in Pilate's court, looking, and looking on to Jesus and shouting, crucify him. And in chapter 11, we will see that Jews can be grafted back into the root after having hardened hearts. God is just. Our condemnation is earned by no faith, no dependence, no repentance. God's judgment of wrath is deserved against the person with a hard heart who rejects God. Romans 1.20 says it reminds us about those who resist the revelation of God. John 5, Jesus points out, you don't believe Moses because Moses wrote about me, Jesus. 
In 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12, it says that our hearts rejected truth. And then the self-deluding influence that is rejection, well, what follows from that is condemnation to wrath. So hardening is, is different from faith. Hardening does not mean chosen for damnation. We are all in this process of hardening or softening, going toward wrath or toward mercy. A believer who rejects their faith can become hardened. And in the opening of chapter 10, Paul is praying with deep desire for Israel to change their hardened heart to faith in Jesus. Paul knows Israel's hardened heart is not permanent. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God on behalf of my fellow Israelites is for their salvation. For I can testify that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not in line with the truth. For ignoring right standing that comes from God, you, Israelites, seek to get right standing from your own deeds by following the law, justifying yourself, not submitting to God's plan for right standing and relationship with him. For Christ is the end of the law, with the result that there is righteousness for everyone who believes. The Greek word here, end, means termination, but also the word means goal. Like end game. So the end of a marathon is to finish the race. The goal, the purpose of the marathon is to finish. So Israel is so focused on the law, they don't, they don't realize they have met the goal. My little sister Holly put me in charge of the games to bring two families together, the bride's family and the groom's family. So I had the job of icebreakers, and I diligently planned three or four games. And after the second game, the families were having spontaneous conversations with each other, getting to know one another. But I was trying to interrupt and, and get to the third game. And my sister reached over and said, Garrett, they're already doing what we set out to accomplish. The law shows you your lust, your pride, your greed. Ouch! I'm just going to put that mirror back in the drawer and never take it out again. Have you ever seen people avoid the topic of religion because it's too convicting? For everyone, the mirror of the law always shows more dirt. Unless we see the mirror of the law for what it is. When you see the law as a believer in God's plan for relationship, you see Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can stand in the place of the mirror and wash our faces clean. This is complete dependency on God's plan. This is a picture of the end of the law, done, finished, fulfilled. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is by the law. The one who does these things will live by them. He's quoting Leviticus 18. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word Jesus is near you, in your mouth, on your tongue, on your, in your words. And in your heart, in your conviction, in your confession, in your repentance, that is the word of faith that we preach. In chapter 4, we looked at how we try to justify ourselves. It's up to me to earn my way to heaven with my good works. And people do this all the time with affection in relationship, trying to get affection or give affection, knowing more than others, producing. If I get these things done today, then, then I matter. Earning. The more I make, the more important I am. The, the busier I am, the more valued I am. Or winning or impressing with our degrees, with our accomplishments. Looking good on the outside. Or even altruistic pursuits like helping. Like raising children. If my kids are successful, then 
I will feel like I earned my place and ascended into heaven. But if you have to do these things, you may as well pull Jesus right down from the cross because you are saying he never had to die for me. He never had to ascend to heaven on my behalf. I speak as a man. I have to scrub my own face clean. I have to descend into the abyss and raise myself up. This is what religious acts do. This is pharisaical, legalistic. And to think that religious acts can take away my sin and death, I speak as a man. We may as well try to bury ourselves and raise ourselves from the dead. No, we are justified by Jesus, who is near to us, just as if I'd never sinned. Quoting Deuteronomy 9 and Deuteronomy 30, just as God provided the law, God provided Messiah. God sends the law for your sake, but you fail to obey. God sends the Messiah to fill the law for your sake, so you will have faith in God's rescue plan for humanity. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the high point, dramatic crescendo that Paul has taken 10 chapters to get to. This is the whole argument Paul presents here. He will answer the question, the theme, the title for his letter to the Romans that he started in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation the, to save humanity to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from our faith to God's faithfulness in fulfilling what he has promised. Just as it is written, the righteous by faith will live. For with the heart one believes and thus has righteousness and with the mouth one confesses and thus has salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You will not be embarrassed by standing up to the culture and proclaiming Jesus is God. Quoting Isaiah 28 here, For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. All are equal at the foot of the cross. For the same Lord is Lord of all, who richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no having to wonder, hmm, will I be saved? No, will be saved is definitive from Joel. Yahweh is now applied to the name of Jesus. How are they to call on one they have not believed in? And how are they to believe in one they have not heard of? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? You remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist preached repent. Jesus, Jesus preached the message, repent. So helping others as the church, that's great. It's wonderful. Don't forget that, but don't forget to preach, repent. Peter and John were ordered not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus is just as controversial today as 2,000 years ago. Would you trust his deity if his name was just as tame as any other historical religious figure? Are you going to not speak or teach in the name of Jesus under the pressure of our culture? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how timely is the arrival of those who proclaim the good news? quoting Isaiah 52 and Nahum 1. But not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Isaiah 53, and we need to respect those who reject our invitation when we share who Jesus is. Consequently, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the preached word of Christ. So don't be discouraged by those who reject God's plan, who don't receive Jesus and accept the forgiveness of their sins. We offer God's invitation to others, not for the result of their decision, 
but because we know the truth and we love them enough to share the truth. When you feel like someone demands answers about God, they find him implausible, well, realize you will never convince them if they have determined not to convince themselves. Ask them this question. Hey, if you knew the Bible was true, if you knew Jesus was God, would you follow Jesus? Many are just running from God. They're, they don't want uh, the things of God. They don't want to be morally obligated to, to do something. They like running their own lives. They like continue to sleep with their boyfriend or girlfriend or, or uh, looking at porn. But God's plan starts with a tiny faith, our faith, on the inside. And through God's faithfulness in calling Israel to preserve Torah by electing the Jewish nation to bring about Jesus, the Messiah, God determined ahead of time he would extend mercy and grace to give us salvation, redemption. Then all nations Look on the body of Christ on the outside, like right living, service, and fruit. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Have you ever thought that? Well, greater and lesser faiths are discussed in the Bible. Look at Acts 6. Stephen, it says, was full of faith. There was a centurion who Jesus healed, his, his son, and Jesus tells him, I tell you, the, the people standing there, Jesus tells them, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such a faith. There was a man who wanted his, sin, his, his son healed, and uh, Jesus tells him to believe, and he says, I, I do, but help me in my unbelief. So he's mixed. He has a little bit of belief and, and some unbelief. Uh, it says, it, the Bible records in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, he could do no miracles because of the lack of faith of the people of Nazareth. Jesus goes on to say there, are, there was no one greater born of a woman than John the Baptist, even when John was wondering, perhaps having questions about, perhaps even doubting if Jesus is the Messiah. He sent his disciples to ask him this question. So how much faith is enough faith? How much faith do I need for God to love me? Well, instead of thinking this thought, replace it with the true idea to believe. And if I have faith as small as a mustard seed, my relationship will grow into a huge tree. Trust he will grow you and shape you through this process of transformation. That's what he calls you for. That's what he elects you to do. So our faith develops and grows as our relationship with Jesus grows. Consider Peter, the lowly, unlearned fisherman who first confesses Jesus as Messiah at the seashore. This is conversion from, from following his selfish, fleshly ambitions to follow Jesus. So he leaves his nets and boat at the seashore. But Peter still has a lot of growing, a lot of transforming to do. When Jesus asks Peter pointedly, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah. But in the next breath, Peter starts telling Jesus, here's what I have in mind. Oh, you're not going to die. Then... We are going to take Rome. Well, this is looking at the, the world from man's perspective. Jesus rebukes him. And later, uh, when Jesus is taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter denies Jesus three times. But when confronted by the resurrected Jesus at the seashore, he was convicted in his heart. And Peter repents. Peter's faith grows so strong, he gets a beatdown in Jerusalem one time and is told to never speak of Jesus again. But Peter trusts God and will not be quiet about Jesus. Peter is thrown into jail and has faith in God. 
all the way to the day of Peter's dying, when, when it's his dying day when he's crucified, and Peter has faith in God's faithfulness. He's proclaiming Jesus as God's Son, as the Messiah. So come with your questions. Bring them to God. God promised, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, God will open the door and make himself clear to you. Unbelief is, in part, lack of knowing. In part, lack of trusting and submitting to his plan to partner with you and accomplish his purpose. So more hearing, more faith. Personally, I have an audio Bible on my phone, and instead of scrolling through Instagram, I listen to God's truth. Now, we choose to depend on God. God chooses to shape us into his vessels of mercy. But I ask, have they not heard? Yes, they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world, quoting Psalm 19. Israel has no excuse, just like those who have not heard the tribes in the Amazon, have seen creation. They have a conscience. They will be judged according to what they know. But how much more do you, Israel, know? You have the law, you have the prophets, which point to Jesus. But again, I ask, didn't Israel understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation. With a senseless nation, I will provoke you to anger. Quoting Deuteronomy 32, Paul just lets Scripture prove the words in his letter to the Romans and prove that they are true. So Scripture interprets Scripture. And Isaiah is even bold enough to say, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became well known to those who did not ask for me. Quoting Isaiah 65, He's taking us on a treasure hunt all over the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. But about Israel, he says, all day long, I held out my hands to this disobedient and stubborn people. Our great gift of a will is given to us by God because we are formed in his image. We can freely choose to love him in relationship, or we freely choose to reject him, harden our hearts to the things of God. Consider the example of Sosthenes in Acts 18, tw verses 12 to 17. It's recorded in the Bible. In Achaia, Paul was preaching about Jesus, and Jews there brought Paul before the Roman council. The Jewish leader said, This man, Paul, is persuading people to worship God in a way contrary to the law. All this talk about Jesus fulfilling the law. Now, Gallio, the, the proconsul, wouldn't have anything to do with the matter because he said this was a matter of your religion. So they went to Sosthenes, Sosthenes, who was the president of the local Jewish synagogue. And why did they go to Sosthenes? They went to him to get an a, a approval for a beatdown of Paul. And Sosthenes, in his hard-heartedness, allows these men who were in, you know, remember Sosthenes is in charge of these men, and he authorizes this innocent man, Paul, to get an official beatdown, ordered and, and commended by the president of the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. Now, turn to me, uh, you know, this wasn't the end of the beautiful redemption of Sosthenes. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Here Paul rejoice. Paul says, Sosthenes, our brother. You know, the one that gave me a beat down. Oh yeah, Sosthenes, he's with us. He opposed Paul's message of Jesus, the ways of God. Sosthenes was once lost. Now he has faith and is found. Sosthenes is saved. His heart of stone is full of love and faith in the Redeemer. 